Hello everyone, thank you for joining Ranger 4's webcast, DevOps for Architects. Here to facilitate the discussion this afternoon is Helen Beale and Daniel Breston. As mentioned earlier, please write any questions you may have in the chat box or use the question function in your GoToWebinar control panel and they'll be answered at the end. I will now pass it over to Helen and Daniel. Lovely, thanks Pranka and good morning, good afternoon to everybody on the call today. Um, I'm Helen Beale and today we are going to be talking about DevOps for Architects as Pranka just said. Um, as Pranka also said, I'm joined by my colleague Daniel. Say hello Daniel. Hello Daniel. Thank Ready? you. Um, so first of all, I thought we'd put some context into why we're having this conversation. I know that a lot of people on the call today are quite regular listeners to our webcasts, um, so thank you all for coming along again. Um, to those of you that are new, uh, most of our webcasts are generated by feedback that we receive from our customers in a typical DevOps manner. If you're familiar with the three ways, you'll know that the second way is about amplifying feedback loops. And I was in a meeting one day and an architect said, why does no one ever talk about DevOps for architects? You know, where do we fit in? To this thing so um, we decided to have this particular webcast and it has proved extremely popular so it's obviously a topic that has um, struck um, a lot of people as something interesting to talk about and interesting to consider um, the poll that Pranka just closed just before she opened the call was asking um, the everybody on the call actually what kind of architect are you so I'll quickly um, share the results of that poll with you now um, so you can see there um, that actually the, the most popular answer was that people weren't, aren't architects on this call, so that's very interesting. I think um, those people are probably the DevOps change agents. And then out of the rest, um, we've got um, some software architects, no infrastructure architects, but they may well be cloud architects now, and a few enterprise architects. So thank you for those of you that joined early enough to uh, participate in the poll. So let's have this conversation. Um, and the first thing I wanted to, to talk about was kind of my view initially of where architects fit in. So obviously when we're talking about DevOps, the very term itself describes development and operations. But for me, and hopefully this picture um, depicts this, architects are like an umbrella that cross the entire software de delivery lifecycle or software development lifecycle. They need to understand the whole system um, end to end in terms of platforms, in terms of application, in terms of everything. So with the, all this in, all encompassing view then, what do architects need to be concerned about when a DevOps transformation is ha happening? So we just kind of established in our poll that there are different types of architect and, and certainly each type, different type of architect is going to have different views. So an enterprise architect will certainly be I'm very concerned with everything going on across all of the, the systems. Um, but you might have architects that are only interested in the cloud piece, for example, or very particular about security. Um, we're also seeing um, occasionally out there this term, the DevOps solutions architect, that you can see down in the, the bottom right there, or DevOps architect. Um, and you saw a couple of them, I'll just split back, there's another one here on the left. So if you do a search on LinkedIn, you will find DevOps architects out there. But interestingly, when we did a DevOps architect search on Google Trends, this is the result we got, that there's nothing out there. And we use Google Trends a lot. Um, we monitor things like, if you've been on our webcast before, you'll see us looking at the, the popularity of terms like DevOps engineer. You'll see us comparing the term DevOps to things like ITSM um, and Lean and Agile. And so this is quite interesting to me that there is um, absolutely no interest, apparently, in the DevOps architect's term. That said, there are... Um, as we've seen on LinkedIn that people are carrying this job title, um, we are also seeing people advertising jobs with this title. Um, and in fact, there are books out there on this subject as well. So this is an extract from um, the book that is titled DevOps as Software Architects by uh, Len Bass and Ingo Weber. Um, and this is kind of a, a nice summary of the things that they, and that the book is quite long, it's a, a good six hour plus read. Um, so probably what's that, three or three hundred and fifty pages. Um, but this was quite a nice summary of, of an what an architect involved in a DevOps project should ensure is happening. Um, 
And I think we've got quite a lot to say about this, really. I mean, the traceability important part is really important, and we'll kind of come back to this a little bit later when we talk about um, metrics and ideation to realisation. But what Daniel and I commonly see in organisations is that lots of teams will have gone and picked up um, tools of their own. So we can go into almost any organisation and talk about DevOps transformation and ask them what tools they're using and tick off that they are using Puppet and Chef and Jenkins and Maven and Artifactory and Ansible and a bit of absolutely everything that's available. And I think it's one of the jobs of the architect is to try and get some kind of control over that sprawl and try and have some kind of standardization around the tool chain with their eye on the goal that they need to be able to, to trace a feature's progress through the tool chain and out the other side into um, the customer's delighted hands. And um, Daniel, I think you've got some thoughts on, on this as well. Yes. Um... I think if they don't understand what they have, then they can't help make sure that the right environments are up and running. I also think that traceable, as, as you said, is very important, especially now that people are starting to go into the cloud. So it, it's not as easy now for people to, uh, you know, just look into your server room and say, okay, this is the stuff we got. Now it can be anywhere. And so you re they really need to be involved, architects really need to be involved in that deployment pipeline and that feature creation and use. So shifting left. So shifting left. But I think yeah. you've got some uh, a level of interest in the automated test as well, and well, application again, performance monitoring. Yeah, you know, it's a huge thing that you and I see commonly with organizations, I'd say, this is, in almost every organization we work with, this is a, a weak area, a gap, if you like, in the tool chain that, that people haven't kind of got their automated tests um, done properly. And, you know, the architect is going to be concerned um, that what goes out the door is high quality. You know, there's a, a banking software company that you and I work with very closely and a project there which is all about prioritizing quality is being driven by their enterprise architect. Um, as the person that has identified that as a, a key payment point to be to be fixed. So it's not coming from QA, and, and DevOps projects do often come from QA, but it was interesting to see an architect um, with such pinpointed gaze on the testing process. And in fact, you um, you ran a, an enterprise architecture workshop with that, that team there. And the, what, what happened about the testing piece then? The testing was deemed to be, well, they finally agreed that testing was deemed to be quite important and they, but they had, they now need to step out of their comfort zone and say, we need to test from the time we start coding, not just the time that we deliver it. And we also need to be testing and monitoring afterwards to make sure that what we're doing and how people are using it, that it's actually, you know, matching value, which is something that we'll discuss later also. Is, is all occurring. So all of these discussions or various things that are important to improving the use of technology are now being, you know, is now really the role of an architect. And that, that point about measuring value is really key and I, I, I'm very interested by this fourth point that, that Len and Ingo raised around feature toggles because for me this seems like quite a, a specific area. Um, I totally agree with the importance of being able to do feature toggling and that's a really important way of us being able to identify um, where value is coming from but I was quite surprised to see um, what is you know it's quite a specific action to be listed there in, in the architects um, kind of key responsibilities around DevOps. I think yeah it goes back to you know the A-B testing and when are we really the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment and should we have it in releasable state all the time and when do we release it and how do we release it so these are all things that have been happening for years now but the tools are there to make it happen very very quickly and that yeah. needs to be monitored because you might release something out to your environment or to your users or you know that you really didn't mean to and this is also about velocity, which brings us quite nicely onto this, this next consideration, which has been a real hot topic for us in the last couple of months. Um, I, I first kind of started really thinking about it primarily because we have a couple of customers whose 
Um, quite often what we see is the CIO speaks to Gartner and Gartner mentions something and we do benefit from this because CIOs get told they must do DevOps and then people come and ask us how to do DevOps. But a lot of CIOs at the moment are being told to, to do things in a bimodal IT way and I kind of heard the term and kind of brushed past it and, and thought, yeah. Um, and then I read an article with Rosalind Ratcliffe, who's a distinguished engineer at IBM, and Alan Schimmel on DevOps.com, a podcast um, transcript. And Rosalind was making the point that she was really uncomfortable with the term bimodal IT and that she much preferred the term variable speed IT. And that resonated with me. And I guess I started to, to sit up and think about it. And Daniel and I had a chat about it. And I think, Daniel, you then put something on the ITSM group in Facebook and created a bit of a social media storm. <laughs> Me? Yes, Never. you. <laughs> Never. Well, what were people saying? Everyone agreed that based on the service or based on the feature or product, you're going to have IT doing things at different times. That's not the issue. The issue is, do you, and this has been going on for years. I mean, I've been in IT forever. And we've always had, you know, the way that you do HR versus the way that you do your everyday banking system are, are going to be, you know, two different things on your service catalog from an IT perspective. The issue is, is that if you start grouping people into old world, new world, core systems, not core systems, or however you want to go and, and make your organization bimodal, you're introducing a silo, and that's anti-DevOps. And that's an anti-DevOps pattern. <clears throat> and all the seminars that you've done on patterns in DevOps, this is clearly not a good thing. You don't want to create another, another silo. You want to create better, faster, safer across everyone that's involved in the architecture. I, 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 this term winds me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and me too, and I totally agree with everything you said. I think it's a massive oversimplification of what organisations look like that have lots and lots of different systems that all travel at different speeds at different times. You know, it doesn't appreciate the complexity of, of the things that people have to do. And as you say, if you silo, you're creating more barriers. That's more barriers to communication and more barriers to collaboration. So Daniel and I were quite excited last week when we went to the DevOps Days London event to see, I think it was John Clapham's presentation that was entitled uh, The Snake Oil of Bimodal IT. And one of the, so we were like, hooray, it's not just us. Um, we kind of knew that already because there'd been a few little um, things going on on social media um, with both of us um, that had real, made us realise that we were certainly not alone. But, you know, Jez Humble is extremely well known um, in the IT marketplace for his lean expertise and his DevOps expertise. And he had published a blog early last week, um, and this is an extract from it. And this is kind of the real thing that, that I think winds us up most in DevOps is, as Jez describes it, this assumption that you can't have um, quality and speed together. When we talk about doing DevOps, we're talking about making better software faster and more safely. And if we think that we can't have one without the other, then that's a massive mistake. So from an architectural point of view, um, we should have those two things in our, our minds all the time. How can we make this process faster? How can we make, um, the, how can we reduce the waste and take the friction out of anything we're trying to do whilst building quality in all of the time? And that really is the role of the architect. This is where he governs change in the use of technology and helps ensure that what's happening is happening when it's supposed to be happening, not just because somebody wants to do things 11,000 times a minute. Totally. So bimodal IT, pa, we, we discard that. <laughs> um, so microservices, again, very popular term, um, has been for quite some time. I first mentioned it in a breakfast briefing about a year ago in the audience was actually uh, the enterprise architect that we were talking about a little while ago actually from the banking software company who um, is a very experienced chap, has um, seen lots of change, started his career um, in the labs of a very large global software vendor 
Um, and he completely poo-pooed the, the concept of microservices. He said, it's a ridiculous new term. We've been doing this stuff forever. It's not really all that different from service oriented architectures. Um, and kind of took the conversation away a little bit. But I think it is a really important thing to consider when we're talking about DevOps, because it gets us back to this kind of legacy conversation that we were just sort of touching on when we talk about bimodal. People talk about legacy applications, and when they use that term, I think what they often mean is applications that have been developed in a waterfall manner that are quite monolithic. If we want to do things at speed and iteratively, doing that with a monolithic application is extremely challenging. So we need um, applications that are, if you like, composed of smaller bits so that we can iterate on those little bits. Um, this is all quite challenging. Now, let's um, do a little bit of kind of uh, contextualization for a moment. Daniel, talk to me about what legacy means, and then let's talk about when an architect needs to consider re-architecting what we might call a legacy app. Well, I like the definition of, of legacy that I read from a CIO where he said, whatever I introduce today is my legacy tomorrow. I think we've moved on from, or hopefully lots of people have moved on from, the point of view to where you have core systems and you have non-core systems. You have old stuff that we, you know, developed years ago and now we've got these new digital things. Well, your digital today is going to be your legacy tomorrow. And if you don't start planning on how to improve it and how to maintain it, then you've got a problem and you need a new architect. Yeah. It's a tough one though, isn't it? Because it, generally, the vast majority of organizations we work with are decades old and they have applications that may be decades old as well. And, and huge amounts of man years of investment building them. So if they want to do DevOps how, and they think their application is monolithic, how do they decide whether it's worth it and how to do it. I think they have to go back to what DevOps is driving to, which is, you know, what is the flow of, of data and transaction and use from the customer's point of view? How are you going to satisfy that customer? And, and if necessary, how do you then change the system that you're using to make that experience better, faster, safer for that particular customer, whether they're internal or external. And then you just go back to everyday good old architecture type stuff. Yeah. So this slide now that we're showing, I first used this about a year and a half, two years ago, again at a breakfast briefing that we had. Um, and I'd structured the panel discussion of the breakfast briefing around um, an article by Ronnie Colville of Gartner, one of their DevOps analysts, and she'd written an article called, I think it was the seven steps to DevOps, and I think this was from step two, which was pick an application, pick an application to DevOps, basically. And at the time, this made quite a lot of sense to me, and this kind of labelling or putting different types of things in different boxes and, and classifying them, I kind of liked. And, you know, we have the monolithic legacy apps as a system of record, and we have the digitized composed app, composable apps in the systems of innovation and and we kind of initially thought well those those web faced you know web facing apps those new apps in innovative apps they're much more suited to devops um, and the traditional ones much less so but as time went on we realized the business criticality of a lot of these what would be termed systems record or legacy apps and actually that they would benefit from having a devops approach they did need to change frequently. And as time has gone on, I, and Dan and I had this discussion earlier, he, he said, do you like this approach? And I said, well, the thing is, now that I've made my mind up about bimodal IT, when I look at this slide, what I see is the foundation of the bimodal IT thinking. And now it looks quite dangerous to me because it's saying there's a whole load of systems that you can't um, treat with speed, which I think is fundamentally wrong. And we've seen it as being fundamentally wrong in the organizations that we work with that have found ways of managing to make change in core critical heritage or cherished as I used to have a customer or do it all business critical core systems. Um, I think we're on the same page with this one Daniel. I totally agree. I think it goes back to 
who is using your technology? Why do they want to use it? How can you help them? And if you keep the discussion at that level, agile, lean, IT service management, all blended together into DevOps is, is of significant help to you in creating a way forward that makes, that makes that use of technology sensible. And I don't want to look like we're picking on Gartner. We're not picking on Gartner. We're just, you know, from an architecture, from an architect point of view, they need to be guiding that discussion. Absolutely. This is a topic that we don't talk about very often, actually, at, at Range 4. Um, we're kind of at the point where a lot of our customers talk about Docker. More and more are starting to use it mainly in the kind of pre-prod and development environment, but when we're talking more and more with our customers about migrating to the cloud, you know, how and if and when that can happen, which applications can go, which ones can't, um, those kind of conversations, and a conversation about microservices, and therefore how does the microservice architecture look? look do Does each microservice have its own container in a shared VM, and these kind of things, and suddenly containerization becomes quite a critical conversation for an architect um, and quite fundamental to speed. I threw this in just for a little moment of lightness. I'm a little bit obsessed at the moment about people that build the home, homes out of old sea containers so this is, or shipping containers. This is an example of a very beautiful home that someone's built by buying these old containers, which you can pick up off on eBay, I found, for about uh, 2,000 quid. So you can build a house for about 30,000 pounds, which is quite amazing, I think. Daniel, do you have anything more sensible to say on the subject of containerization? Well, <laughs> hold on I go to mute and stop laughing. Uh, <laughs> containerization is infrastructure as code, or software as code or whole services code. And depending on how you want to let people do things, especially as they start to go toward a virtual environment or a cloud environment, this is going to help you get things up and running as quickly as possible. You know, the, the days of it's going to take us 400,000 pounds in 12 weeks to go and create an environment are gone. You sign on to some service, you give them a credit card number, and the next thing you know, you've got a data center. They did that using containerization, and people need to be taking advantage of that, no matter what industry or organization type they have. Yeah. That's my, that's my view. And, the yeah. and again, the architects are the one that say, you can use this, you can't use that. Yeah, and the world has changed. We need to, the architects need to understand how the people in their organization are consuming stuff and how they can consume stuff. Now you touched on this this earlier, we talk about Agile a lot, Agile being one of the underpinning um, motivations if you like or converging methodologies that are really driving DevOps forward. So an architect obviously needs to be cognizant of what his or her organization is doing in terms of taking on Agile but we had a think about this and we thought well you know where is the architect in a scrum team? Where is the description of what an architect does? So um, we took a, a fairly standard um, agile description diagram, as you can see here, and put the architect in it. So, so Daniel, what did, what did we learn when we, when we thought about this and when we, we put the architect in there? I think there are some organizations that have used agile and only used it within their development environment. And then what ends up happening is that the architects or the rest of IT is looked at as being not part of the delivery cycle or an obstacle to the delivery cycle. I think people are starting to look at if they blend agile with IT service management or they blend agile and change the role of an architect to be a product owner because infrastructure as code is a product. Governance processes are products. Monitoring tools are products. How do we improve those? This makes sense. 
you can get things done in an iterative fashion. You can get people involved in an iterative fashion. You can continue to do improvement in an iterative fashion, which is all very cool and very DevOps. So I love this picture. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? For me, it really kind of, again, you know, that role of the architect as being an umbrella here, it places the architect kind of front and center in, in everything that's going on. He needs to have a view of what the product owner is agreeing, what's going into the backlog, how it's progressing through, making sure everything fits with the overall vision of what the system should look like. So let's have a chat about security as well. So um, we spend a lot of time talking about security these days um, at, at Range 4, partly because of our relationship with Sonotype. And one thing they've really taught us is the importance of security at the application level. So most companies have got pretty good security when it comes to kind of infrastructure and networks and firewalls and DMZs and things like this. But um, a lot of people haven't really thought about their application security. And this should be of a fairly high concern to an architect because what's actually happening here is that um, developers tend not to code kind of raw Java these days. What they tend to do is go out and um, download artifacts, open source artifacts and binaries from the internet which then go and reside in some kind of artifact repository uh, like Artifactory or Maven and are managed from there. Um, and you know this makes a lot of sense. Why would you reinvent the wheel? Why would you recode something that sort of somebody has already recoded? Uh, sorry, that somebody has already coded for you. Um, there's you know huge amounts of time being saved from, in terms of development effort. However, there are a couple of problems with this approach, and one is that um, these downloaded binaries may well have um, vulnerabilities inside them. They may well have license rules that suddenly mean that they're not actually open source. Um, and free and you know to be have anything done to them when they're used in certain types of environments. Um, there is a, a URL at the bottom of this page and this is a, a live tool that Sonotype have made available where you can start kind of fiddling with the, the numbers of things in your own environments and numbers of apps you have and components and start looking at the, the complexity and the security impact um, that your application models or the way that you use open source in your applications may have on you. Um, the other thing we can do um, for you with your permission is we can run a vulnerability assessment like this and it's, this is run on the, um, the, the public uh, DNS that we can see if there's any kind of other any other IP addresses that you might be using then to get a fully detailed report um, we can we can produce that for you but we can basically um, show you what we know about um, what you're downloading and, and putting into repositories and what we know about those particular things um, that you're consuming and which bits you're going to have vulnerabilities in and then we can help you, you fix them. So this is a really powerful tool for an architect. Um, this is the only tool out there that can do this kind of thing. If you wanted to do this yourself without this tool, you would have to literally go and visit every developer in your organization and interview them with a clipboard and a spreadsheet and rely on what they could tell you that they remembered that they downloaded and then you'd have to go away and look the thing up and figure out what its vulnerability um, profile looked like. So Daniel, um, in the, again in the, his Facebook group, his ISM group that, um, that we're both part of, um, also had this security story to tell that we thought was very appropriate for um, architects when they're, you know, considering um, DevOps transformation considerations from an architect's point of view. Uh, Daniel, tell us a little bit more about this story. Uh, well, I haven't read it in full, but the, the basics is we went and created an application and we went and created a service for our customers and we didn't have any security firewalls. And for a bank to create infrastructure with no firewalls is just staggering in today's environment. Back when I first started in IT, nobody could get to us. We were very secure, but then this was well before the introduction of the internet. Now that there's the internet and everyone is connected to everyone through some network somewhere, you're just a target. And if you're not going to have a firewall, <laughs> Here just like open season. So this was just a deft example. And it, all it would, would have really taken is an enterprise architect, a security architect, to say, we have a problem here. This is really a security risk. And that architects are there to help mitigate 
and remove security. Uh, I mean, it's, it's mitigate risk. And that's their, really the number one job. Yeah, and this is a fundamental part of better software faster and more safely. That security element has to be woven in right from the start. So moving on to Daniel's favorite subject, metrics that really matter. Yay. Um, <laughs> yay. Um, we've taken a few slides from a, a recent report, actually, um, that we will um, endeavor to link in the follow-up email, but you can also see the URL at the bottom of the, the slide. Um, these are anti-pattern metrics for DevOps. Um, Daniel, talk us through them and, and your view on, on why these are unhelpful. Before I do that, could you just explain anti-matter, anti-pattern, please? Because you do a much better the job, job than I do. Yeah, I'm very pleased that you're not asking me to explain anti-matter because I would have problems with that one. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> tongue-tied here. So um, a pattern is something that we say. I have shame we haven't got that lovely slide about the the cloud formations and how you see patterns in cloud formations. I've forgotten what that word is now. It's such a good word, but anyway. Um, a pattern is something that we see repeating itself um, and a good pattern, so that's what we'd refer to normally just as a pattern, is something that we think is, is basically best practice. So that would be things like the way that we um, reorganize teams around products when we're moving towards um, agile or iter iterative development processes. An anti-pattern is something that we see happening lots but is detrimental to the organization's goals. So in DevOps, a anti typical anti-pattern that we talk about quite a lot is the DevOps team. Um, now, there are pros and cons to having a DevOps team, the, the pros being if you see it as a temporary state, so a state of transition while you evangelize and proliferate DevOps thinking, it can be quite effective. But um, in the same way that we talked about, if you do by, by modal IT, you could potentially be creating additional silos in an organization where you're trying to break down barriers and improve collaboration by having a DevOps team you're effectively creating another silo. So when we talk about anti-pattern metrics we're talking really about metrics that we see happening often but that we believe are unhelpful um, and these are CA's examples. So for me the metrics then that are involved <coughs> and, and, and this is you know excellent example of if you're trying to help people do better, faster, safer, and you're trying to help people collaborate together and communicate and work together to create something for a customer, then the last thing you want is to judge them on whether or not they created X number of lines of code or X number of function points today because they may have done that and they were all rubbish. You, you want them concentrating on, on good stuff or you know, development changes. We, we did things very quickly. The operation was a success, but the patient died is not a very good intra team metric. And the same with traditional metrics. Uh, number of people for servers is just daft in a cloud environment or in a virtual world environment. Or mean time between failure, what you really want to be measuring is mean time to respond. Because things are going to break. And what and while it's important to know how long it is between outages, it's more important to know that you can get things back up and running again quickly. This might be a good point to talk about your um, six R's, so your MTTR, so you just said mean time to res respond, whereas I tend to talk about mean time to recover or to repair. So what are the R's? So to me, there is, it's not just repair, it's you know, respond to me is a big word. It's the fact that I knew about it. So now I know that the enterprise architect and everyone else has done the right level of alerting and monitoring off of, the, I'm sorry, the right level of monitoring and alerting off of that, that people have actually responded. Somebody owns that incident. Someone is dealing with that particular issue that's causing a customer an issue that understand that there are ways of, of dealing with it that are approved, so the architect should be involved in, in helping create safe practices to uh, introduce a countermeasure to fix something. And if they don't know what to do, they need to be able to respond in such a way that they can escalate to find somebody that can help them. And now that you've repaired it, or at least put in some type of countermeasure, you may need to do some type of restore to get things back to normal 
before you, you, know, you finish your recovery exercise, which then returns it back to the customer in a state that they expect. So it's all kinds of R's in that meantime scenario. So let's have a look at some, um, some metrics that make us a little bit happier. And we can see MTTR is, is there. Um, for me, my favorite is actually revenue per user story. This is kind of the fundamental of what we're trying to do with ideation to realization that we'll probably delve into in a little bit deeper in a few minutes' time. But um, Daniel, which of the top ones are, are for you on here? And are there any key ones that are really missing for you? From a lean perspective, I'm going to look at the uh, two primarily. One is the morale and job satisfaction survey. Uh, uh, number and the other one is anything that lets me measure the customer satisfaction which could be conversion which could be an NPS which could be revenue but you know anything that lets me know that the customer is satisfied with with what I'm doing so those two to me are paramount because if that's not happening then whatever I'm doing in my technology really doesn't matter I mean look at the businesses that are you know having issues today. They're having issues today because top down the morale and job satisfaction and the way that they're dealing with customers isn't satisfactory. Yeah, and we do have to do so much work with people on culture because it is the, the hardest thing to change and actually, you know, our, our motto or our, our kind of why, organization why or evolutionary purpose at Range 4, we describe as being fanatical about making life on uh, fantastic. So underpinning kind of everything that we we, un we do is the idea that people should be happy and joyful and enjoy their working life. So um, the culture needs to be good, behaviours need to be um, positive and healthy. This one is a little bit difficult to read, so apologies about that. But this is a balanced scorecard, um, again from the same report from CA. Um, now I look at it and I just kind of go, wow, this looks complicated. And then I wonder or ponder, and, and Daniel will, will contribute his thoughts on this in a minute, but for me it's like I think about the time it would take an organisation to pull one of these together and the actual real value that it would give back to them. Now I've done these kind of things as part of personal development plans, things like that before, and just found them really quite onerous. And Daniel, I think you've you've used them in your professional environment to actually try and control an IT department and you found something similar? I, I, I have also found it similar. I, I, I think that Kaplan and Norton you know, created a product that was usable in some types of organizations and, and maybe it's my understanding that that means that I don't really know how to use it. I needed something more visual. I needed something that could really be turned on and off and go red and green very quickly to let me know that I was having an issue somewhere. Where was I having that issue? Why was I having that issue? So that people could go get involved to, to help uh, turn it back to what it was supposed to be, which is expectation. And, and I, I, since I was never able to do that with a balanced scorecard, I, I, I don't use them. That's not to say that they're not good, that's just to say that I'm not a practitioner of a balanced scorecard. Yeah, we're not huge fans. What we are huge fans of is this concept of ideation to realisation. So having the ability to trace a feature um, all the way through its life cycle and being able to measure its value when it goes live. And that for me is the ultimate metric that matters. Um, it made me want to go back to this slide that we had right at the start of the presentation. Um, which really talked about having this traceability and being able to toggle features to give you, you know, the whole point of feature toggle is enabling you to switch things on and off to see what um, particular impact they have. Um, so that's there. So what now for you, and um, thank you very much for attending um, this webcast. We'll be taking questions in just a few moments, so if you have them, um, I can see there's a couple popped up already. Um, in the question box. So there's a couple there, you can put them in the question box or you can put them um, in the chat box. Um, we do have a course coming up that we thought would be um, relevant to um, architects in particular. It's a Certified Agile Service Manager course. Um, Daniel will be delivering it. The next one we have um, is at the end of next month. 
um, in our offices in Covent Garden um, is a DevOps Institute course and um, since Daniel's a tutor perhaps you'd like to say a couple more words about what is in the course, why it's um, particularly suitable for architects in our opinion. This, this course takes two movements that underpin DevOps, Agile and IT service management, throws them in the blender and says, look, at the end of the day, you're producing something that is going to help a customer do something in terms of a service. And that service is going to be comprised of technology. And since it's comprised of technology, you need to be able to create it, and monitor it, and manage it, and, and do all, all, all the other stuff. And you can benefit from uh, mixing Agile into your, into your practices, into your governance practices, into your metrics and monitoring, which is a perfect thing for an architect to view themselves as an Agile service manager. Thank you. So um, if you want to book that, just come to our website, drop us an email, or we'll, um, in the follow-up email we'll send a little link to where you can um, book yourself on that course. So key takeaways from this session, um, before we get on to the questions, Daniel, do you want to talk us through um, what we want to leave people with today? I think architects are that glue. They're, they're, they're the I understand how to best use technology for my organization and because of that they should be involved in the discussion and they should be involved in the discussion often. They, they help in the definition part, they help in the design part, they help through delivery and fixing things. And because of that they can apply the right metrics not only to the technology but uh, bringing it back to value for the business, improving that value. So you know, don't do this stuff in, in isolation. Architects that do things in blue rooms and don't get everyone else involved and come out with something that say, okay, this is what, what, what you want you guys to do, you know, prepare to be shot. You should be. But if you can find a way to get people involved and you can test what you're getting ready to do on, you know, on a very rapid basis, creating environments and blowing them away just to make sure that things are right. Now you've got a way to be able to introduce the right type of governance to manage those things no matter where they are in your uh, technology uh, life cycle or where they are in your technology uh, use. And that's me. That's you. That's all you want to say about that one. Okay, that's so me. let's go to some questions, let's see what we've got today. Okay. How do you make the case for, oh, sorry Pranka, no, 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 I'll pick them up. Um, how do you make the case for adding tests to applications that don't currently have them when your business only wants to pay for new features? Fairly straightforward. I guess, I guess the question is, is how you how are you introducing applications if you're not testing them? Where do you get your application performance monitoring? How do you know whether or not your application is running the way that it's, that, that it's supposed to? I'm interested but that the applications don't currently have tests because I'm, I'm wondering if nothing ever fails on them and, and no defects ever getting through? Yeah, it'd be It'd be fun to have a further discussion on that after this call if you wanted to get a hold of us. But uh, did we need, I, I need more. Yeah. Is there a right and wrong way to implement NPS? Most users get annoyed with such primitive validation to see if features are working or not. So I'm not sure that NPS is for uh, figuring out whether a feature is working or not. For me, it's a much wider metric than that. What do you think? I, I agree with you. I think if you isolate it down to a feature or even a product, you're, you're, you're not going to um, get the full value of what NPS provides, which is, you know, looking at the entire customer experience. So how long did it take to get the thing? What was the price? You know, the whole life cycle of idea to realization is what NPS should be looking at. I think that's all the questions that we've got for today. 
um, unless anyone wants to put anything in quickly. So um, we've, it's been a bit of a long one today, so uh, sorry about that people, but thank you everybody um, who has joined us today for your time and attention and your questions. And um, we hope to speak with each and every one of you at some point soon. Yeah. A full thank you will also be sent to everyone. With Thanks, slides Franca. and recording. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. To that summer type thing as well. Yes. And the chasm okay. training. But yes, yes, we'll get that out to you in the next hour or so. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Franca. Thank you, all attendees. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye for now.